Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. Joanne and uh, Gabriel, you have done an amazing work in creating this amazing event. I mean, one of the best I've ever attended in terms of the list of people invited. And I think this is attributed to you, Stefan. And, um, and the lectures accordingly, it's amazing. In fact, let's, let's have it a yearly event. I would say, yes, let's have a chain. <laughs> Stefan 61, <laughs> Stefan 62, <laughs> yes. I will come every year, I'm telling you. I will come every year, and I promise to give the same lecture. <laughs> the, with one slide. And happy birthday, Stefan. Um, thank you so much for the inspiration you have been on my career. Of course, this paper is behind 15 years of my work on sparsity, and you know that. And Stephen is here. Stephen is here. Wow. <laughs> So amazing paper, and I'm not the first to show it, of course. But, and this is not the only one. Um, Remy, I'm not sure whether Remy is here. The work with Remy on, on the analysis cost sparse model is inspired by this, zero crossings of wavelets. And you know, when deep learning came to our lives, I think you were the first to understand that something is something central is happening and we have to adjust and we have to understand the connection. This is a paper from 2012 with Joan. It took me six years more to understand that I need to do something in order to understand whether deep learning has a connection to sparsity. Only then I started thinking about these questions. So six, six years before, just at the very beginning, you already saw this bridge. So when I was walking on this bridge, you were already there, basically constructing more and more of it. So thank you so much and happy birthday. Thanks very much. Yes, th this talk is on image denoising. Hi, Michael. This talk is on image denoising and the new era of it. Basically, the story is these algorithms, these machines that can remove noise from images. And you know there are tens of thousands of papers written on this. Uh, and what I'll try to show you today is that there is a new era to this. There is a there are new horizons opening up to image denoisers, and those are truly exciting. And yes, I have to say this. Unfortunately, Eero's lecture from yesterday overlaps very much with mine, simply because we were inspired by his work and we did a follow-up to it. And when it comes to presenting the topic and showing the background, obviously there, was a, there will be an overlap. Let's hope you won't feel it too much. OK. So I'll start with a brief history of the field of denoising, then move to the main dish, which is those discoveries that I will be talking about, and then summarize. OK. Um, when I'm talking about noise removal from images, I'm thinking specifically about white additive Gaussian noise. That means that my image to be denoised is actually the sum of a clean image and a Gaussian IID uh, image. OK? Why am I restricting? the story to this type of noise, there are a bunch of reasons that could be, um, could be given, or reasons or excuses. 90% of the papers and more on denoising assume Gaussianity, which is a good reason. You know, you could think that the proper assumption would be Poisson, because we are talking about images counting photons in each sensor, but when Poisson has high counts, it's a Gaussian. And when it has a low count, you can always use the Anscombe in order to make it Gaussian. So again, Gaussianity pops up as the choice to work with. Gaussianity is also very pleasant mathematically. I mean, L2 of, so simple, so pleasant. But there is another reason. And people are not aware of this. So most people are not aware of this. Turns out that if you have a denoiser that has been designed to remove white, additive, Gaussian noise, this noise specifically, and you do the best in terms of L2, this is the minimum mean squared error. If you have this device, you are holding in your hand something that has capabilities beyond just denoising. It has capabilities that are inspiring and creating opportunities, which we will be leveraging later on. This is the essence of, of uh, the story. And so over the years, and many of the people sitting here contributed to the evolution of denoising algorithms that had all sorts of flavors. And this evolution is basically the story of image processing in this period of time where priors of images kept improving and improving, and with them, the performance of denoising that we got. And I would say that this 
evolution stopped somewhere in 2010, 2015. Not to say that there are no new papers suggesting classic techniques for denoising, it's just that they are getting less attention. And for a clear reason. The reason is the, um, the paradigm shift. The paradigm shift that took everything that we did in image processing until then, all the attempts to model content of images in all sorts of ways, from piecewise smoothness all the way to sparsity and non-local subsimilarity, etc., and replace this with supervised learning. Just give me sufficient number of images, noisy one, ones, clean, clean ones, and I'll train a machine and I'll do my best. And this, this, of course, brings up the question whether everything we have done over, what, 50, 40 years of work has become obsolete? The answer is not clear. If you ask people for machine learning, the answer is definite. They want to forget everything you have done because they can train and win. But we, those of us who are familiar with this, know that we can actually take elements from what we have done in the past and improve techniques. For example, the last slide from yesterday's talk by Ero, where, where the joint work with Stefan about designing a denoiser based on wavelets and suddenly getting something that is truly competitive with the best of transformers. So here is a way of taking the past and bringing it up in order to leverage it and, and gain something. And a new chapter of evolution started. This time of deep learning based techniques for image denoising, many algorithms, and you have to understand it's not just about denoising better, it's also about solving other problems. For example, adaptation. You have a denoiser, I'm bringing a new image, it doesn't look like anything you've ever seen. Can you adapt to it? Can you take the denoiser and lift it to serve better the image that you have now in your hands and it's only a noisy image? Yes, you can. Can you serve other goals, not just because in our MSE? Can you design uh, denoisers to optimize SSIM? Yes, you can. Can you remove true noise from images? Yes, you can. All these things and many more are dealt with in dozens of papers that appear in the best conferences, CVPR, ICCV, ECCV, and also computer vision, uh, and also um, machine learning conferences like uh, ICML, ICLR, NeurIPS, etc. And so this is not our story, this is just the background. Here comes the story. So you have a denoiser, and it, it turns out that you can use it to do things. You can use it in order to solve inverse problems. You can actually use it in order to regularize inverse problems. This is starting with the work of Charlie Bauman and his co-authors in 2013, and many, many follow-ups, including our work on regularization by denoising. You can synthesize images. You can actually create images out of thin air. We'll talk about that. You can revisit all the chapter on inverse problems in image, image processing and invent it all over again, this time targeting high perceptual quality. I will skip the first because of lack of time, and I'll go straight into the second, the first and the second discoveries. Let's talk about them. Um, since 2014, roughly speaking, people are fascinated by the idea that a machine could generate images. A, a piece of software can actually hallucinate images, generate images out of thin air. We have heard about it yesterday from Eric, I think. It was in the context of GANs. Typically, it is being used in the context of GANs. GANs are those networks, two networks that are fighting. One is a generator, the other is a critic that keeps um, challenging it. And together, they are lifting them th themselves to the point where they are generating good-looking images, and they are good-looking images. These images are not photographed. These images are hallucinated, created by software. These people here, they do not exist. They are, in fact, taken from a web page called this person does not exist.com. You go to this web page and you refresh and you keep getting people. People generated from a database that was used for training and no, there are no repetitions. It's hallucination of images. Now, why are we synthesizing images? We are doing so because it's fascinating. I mean, running code that creates images, it's fascinating. It's tantalizing to see even the mistakes are fascinating. But there are other reasons. You know, us working on image processing, if you have a machine that can generate good looking images, you're holding in your hand the holy grail of image processing. You're holding the prior or something very similar to it. And with it, you can do amazing things. In fact, you can reinvent image processing all over again and do it much better. So here is a good reason to do this, synthesize images. 
So the question is, can we synthesize these images differently? Or oh, more specifically, here is my question. Suppose that I have a good performing denoiser, MMSC denoiser for white additive Gaussian noise. Can I use it in order to synthesize images of the kind we have seen before? The answer is yes. And the answer came in a series of papers, and I'm mentioning here two of them by Yang Song and Ermon from Stanford University. And I'm mentioning the paper that basically Ero presented yesterday. Don't look at the year here, it's not 2021, it is the year in which it was accepted. It was actually published in archive a year and more before. This paper, I have to say, is the one why I started working on diffusion models. Okay? And I came to it by a complete coincidence. I saw the noiser used for regularizing indoor problems and I thought this is similar to my previous work and uh, it swept me. Three papers, they are not alone in this area, many around them, but the message in those three is you have a denoiser, you can actually use it as a projection onto the manifold of images. And it's not a vague concept, it's actually a pure mathematical idea that can be used. And if you dive into these algorithms, what you find is something very interesting. You start with a vector of noise, Gaussian white noise, and you do simple operation denoising, simple operation denoising, you keep doing this, enough times and you end up with a good looking image at the end. So keep running it again and again, you'll get many, many possible images. How does it work? Let's talk about the foundations of this. Um, suppose you have access to P of X, the probability density function of images. Okay, we don't, but suppose you have. I would like to sample from this distribution. It's not trivial, think about it. It's, it's a high dimensional distribution. So what do I do? I'm starting somewhere in the space, X naught, and I'm doing steepest ascent. I'm basically um, um, running this algorithm iteratively where I'm going up the hill over the function log of P of X. What do I get? I get a chain of images that are improving in quality because they are more and more and more probable. Going up the function log of P is just like going up the function P. Okay, this is great, but this will get stuck on a local maxima and it's definitely not a proper sample. If you apply perturbation in each iteration, if you add noise, and if you design your constant A and B properly, you are looking at Langevin dynamics, exactly the kind of tools we, dis we discussed yesterday in Eric's talk. Okay, Langevin dynamics. The original equation is stochastic differential equation. It is known to converge if it is applied to sample from P of X. What you see here is a discretization of it. So you have to be careful about applying it. The, the thing is this animal. This animal is known by the name score function. And this score function is typically not accessible. So what do you do? Because if you have access to P of X, fine. But if you don't, what do you do? A miracle happens. Turns out that this expression can be approximated very well by a denoiser. So go ahead, design your denoiser, which is so pleasant. We know what to do. And the noise that the denoiser detects is exactly this vector you would like to put here. Okay, so we are well equipped. We know what to do. What am I telling you? I'm telling you that a denoiser basically has a lot of knowledge about P of X. Not P of X exactly, but hey, it knows a lot about the score function, which is a cousin of the, of the prior. And yes, just as promised, the algorithm will be very simple. All you have to do is to apply iteratively denoiser and addition of noise with proper quantities, and it will take you properly to the image you want to synthesize. This is great. Yeah. How do you know whether you get a, a horse or a face? You will get all sorts of things, but dictating the kind of images you're creating <laughs> it is all about the design of the denoiser, and we'll see it later on. Now, this algorithm will work, but it will take forever. And why? Think about it. The manifold of images in high dimensional space is very thin. You threw me at X naught somewhere, I'm sitting in the desert, Not, nothing pulls me towards the manifold. What is the probability here? Zero. What is log of zero? God knows. What is the grad? <laughs> what is the grad of that? It means you, uh, the direction you will be applying is basically meaningless. So nothing really pulls you towards the, the manifold. You need the manifold to have some sort of a magnet to pull you in. What do you do? Where do you bring this magnet from? The idea is annealing. You bring annealing to the game. Annealing basically says the following. Don't synthesize images, synthesize noisy images. Sounds crazy. But if the image is noisy, X plus V and V is a noise that added, then the distribution of P uh, of X plus V is basically a convolution of the original P 
with a Gaussian. So I'm blurring the manifold. Suddenly, if I break it, blur it very wide, I'm getting tails that are all over this place and they will pull me in. And so there is a delicate game to be played here. You start with very wide sigma, the tails are there, you know what to do, and now you start running inside and slowly you're also narrowing the, let's go and see this again, you are narrowing the manifold as you run towards it, and you have to be careful not to, not to escape the point that you are iterating with, and if you do all this well, you will be falling eventually onto the manifold, okay? And so, one million steps in the previous algorithm can be replaced with, say, 1,000, and today we have diffusion algorithms, techniques like this, that will do it in 10 steps, even 5 steps. Okay. Um, and does it work? Yes. These are images taken from the paper by Zora Kotkodai and Eros Simoncelli. These are images taken from the paper by Song and Ermon. And yes, exactly to your point, why are they getting faces here? Because they trained on faces, they had a face denoiser. Okay, um, and if you are wondering about the quality, several months after these papers came, came this paper that basically says, listen, today the best technique for synthesizing images are diffusion models of the kind I've just pre presented, with of course all sorts of tweaks and possibilities. And they compare the spread of images created by diffusion to big GAN, one of the better GANs, and the FID being small implies better images. FID. For sure, inception uh, distance basically says what is the distance between the distributions of true images and synthesized images. The smaller, the better. They have some sort of way of assessing this. <coughs> and you've heard about this. This is the point. If you read the news and don't, don't know anything about anything, you must have heard about DALI 2 and Imogen from Google, and you've heard probably of Midjourney and Stable Diffusion. All of them are using the algorithm that I've just presented with a major twist in the story, they are conditioning it on text. So what they do is to take a piece of text, basically the caption, turn it, embed it into a vector, feed it into the denoiser, but down below there is a denoiser that removes white, additive, Gaussian noise, trying to do the MMSE, that's all, okay? And they create amazing results. Okay, let's move on and now let's get closer to our work. Um, Suppose that this is an image that I need to denoise. I know that it suffers from heavy noise, and I'm applying my favorite denoiser, the one that I've trained so well, and I'm getting this result. Should I be happy with this result? Not so much, and I'll tell you why. Because in this case, it's a synthetic case where I actually know the ground truth, and here it is. This is the ground truth, this is the person. So this might be John, I'm not sure whether this is still John. It's a different person, maybe. This image is blurry. Why is it blurry? Okay, this is the question I would like to address. So, um, here is the reason for the blurriness that we get. You see, there is a manifold of good-looking images. Every point on this yellowish curve is a good-looking image. Um, you threw me away from the manifold by adding noise. I'm trying to make my way back. I'm shouting to the manifold, whom among you can explain me? In what sense? Which of the images in this manifold are such that the difference between me and you looks like a Gaussian noise in the sense that it will pass all the tests? All these images raise their hand, and they say, it's me. So what do you do? What do we do? What do we do? We take the expectation, the conditional expectation. We actually average all those images. And by averaging, we get the blurry result. And the heavier the noise, you f the further you are, and you're averaging more and more, and you are losing details, okay? So the question is, can we avoid this? Can we do something in order to push for high perceptual quality denoising? In 2019, we started working on it, knowing nothing about diffusion models. And we asked this question, I want to denoise an image, but I want the output to be crisp, to be so good looking that nobody will, will be able to tell it apart from true images. Can you do that? And we came up with two papers. The first is by Guy Ochayon, Tio Adrai, uh, Grisha Waxman and Pema Milanfar, and what we did there is a conditional GAN. And then we saw your paper, Ero, and in a month or so we came up with another solution based on diffusion. And this is the paper by Bajat Kawar, Grisha Waxman and myself. Uh, two papers attacking the same problem using different tools. Okay? The concept here is, 
There is a probability density function conditional P of X given Y. Y is the noisy image. X is all the possible good looking images. Every one of them has a probability. Instead of taking the expectation of this, sample from it. Sample from it. So two methods, conditional GAN and uh, a, di a diffusion based on MMC denoiser. And you have to understand, if I'm sampling, the game has now changed. I'm not generating a single solution. I'm creating a bunch of solutions, possibilities that will tell you what could have been the image. Okay? Uh, question? Is it worth contrasting that with a map solution, which would also give you a point on the manifold? W definitely. It's a, it's a great question to, to address. You know, finding the map is not so easy. Maybe in the, with diffusion it becomes easy because maybe if we remove the stochasticity, maybe we get the map. The map, it, at least if you believe Tomir Michaeli and Yochai Blau in their paper, is not competitive. Um, so I'll, I'll describe the stochastic approach, the, the, the work by Bahajat. Uh, it goes like this. I'm trying to sample from P of X given Y. And sampling from distribution is something I, I now can do using diffusion techniques. So let's just do it. Start somewhere. In fact, not somewhere. Start with a noisy image. Why bother with something else? And then apply Langevin dynamics. But notice here I'm working with a conditional. OK? So it's a conditional Langevin. And, um, and you know I can use base to replace the order between x, k, and y. So I'll replace the two and get multiplication by p of x divided by p of y. The grad is with respect to x. So the last term will fall off. And I'm getting the sum of two ingredients. So this is replaced by these two. In regular life, the first would have been daunting. Because this is the prior, my God, where do you bring it? But we are not afraid of it anymore. It's a denoiser. Okay? And the second that looks so innocent is actually somewhat problematic. Okay? Why is it problematic? Let me tell you. You see, there are two noises involved here. I remind you, we are running the annealed version of the Langevin, which means that I have measurements noise in Y. And XK here is not the ideal image X that I'm striving to get. It's a noisy image. And it has... Uh, annealing noise. Now, what is the connection between these two noises? And here is something really annoying. If you assume that those two noises are independent, you get stuck. You cannot actually formulate this expression. So what do you do instead? What we found out is that if we take the measurement noise and break it into small ingredients, the measurement noise, and this will be the annealing noise. So the annealing noise is actually portions of the measurement noise. If you do all this, you end up with an expression that is Closed form expression for this um, grad log likelihood. Okay, it's a log, it's a bizarre log likelihood because it takes into account some, uh, no, yeah, some noise of the anything. Five minutes, five minutes. Okay, I I could have used more, <laughs> <laughs> and it works. So basically, because I'm assuming that the annealing is portion of the noise, I'm basically peeling the noise. And so what you see here is, is a starting image and how it evolves into a solution. Now you have to understand, if I run the same algorithm again, I will get a slightly different result, which is totally valid. OK, in fact, let me show you a few more examples. Um, oops. If this is the original image from the previous experiment, and this is the noisy version, and this is the MMSE, what you see here are three samples, three times running the same algorithm. And then you get what? John, David, and Mark. You understand, there is an uncertainty here. And we, we, keep, uh, we keep cheating ourselves when we run MMSE and believing that, hey, this is the solution. No, it's not a solution. It's a spread of possible solutions. What you see here is the same image going through three levels of noise, three MMSE results. The, the bigger the noise, the more averaging happens. And so you lose more details in disguise. And these are samples per each. And the samples are always good looking. Um, same here, per each one of those images, you get four samples and all of them valid. Always we check whether the difference is truly Gaussian in all sorts of uh, statistical tests, etc. No point in talking about that. OK. Um, no, we are going to skip this. And one last thing. Why not do this for inverse problems? I mean, we have de treated denoising, which is y equals x plus n. What about uh, the potential of using age there? It could be in painting, it could be uh, super resolution, it could be deblurring, it could be tomographic reconstruction, all sorts of things. Can we do that? The answer is broadly yes. It's not trivial, I have to say, it's not trivial. It requires some sort of work. 
Uh, why? Because the presence of age really ruins the structure of how do you treat the measurements noise versus the annealing noise. They have to del be delicate there about their connection. And this is exactly what we did in these two papers. In the first, we solved the conceptual problem. In the second, we improved the algorithm in all sorts of ways, which I'll explain. And I'm not going to show you the derivation because of lack of time. And I'll go straight to the result. So if these are original images, and these are the measurements, basically two thirds of something of the image given, but noisy, and the bottom is totally missing. You just run the algorithm, and what you see here are two possible samples. And yes, there is a freedom in the bottom and it is played with, okay? Just as expected. Or in this case, uh, originals, uh, heavily downsampled version factor four in each axis and additive noise, and you're trying to revive the image. And what I show you now are a bunch of samples and yes, there is a var variability in them, uh, which is uh, justified. In fact, I can compute the mean. If I compute the mean of these images, what am I doing? I'm approximating the MMSE. Approximating the MMSE for the, for the inverse problem I'm solving, not for the denoising. So it's a way of getting MMSE for free if you want. And then I can actually compute the standard deviation per each pixel. Basically, I'm getting the diagonal of the covariance matrix of this spread. So I actually sensing the uncertainty in the problem, okay? Same goes here, um, samples, details are very, uh, fine details are changing from one image to the next, uh, heavily blurred images and samples from them and the average and the, uh, um, and the standard deviation. What you see here is compressed sensing, disregard this. Two images went through compressed sensing factor eight. So basically projecting into a bunch of uh, uh, random directions, but one uh, eighth of the quantity of the pixels. What you see here are samples from the distribution. It's beautiful, especially here, because now the age operator is so global that it gives a lot of freedom that uh, we are unaware of. And, and, and this is the average. This is the average. If you would have solved straight using regression, this is what you would have gotten. Uh, and similar here, same image, three levels of compression, four, eight, and 16. And these are samples. These are the means of 20, I think. Uh, samples and this is a standard deviation which of course means the, the, the deeper you compress the less information you have. Um, so let's skip this and let's summarize. How I am in time? Okay. Yeah. Good. So what have, what have we seen? It all starts with a denoiser. It's an innocent looking denoiser the kind of which we are so much so familiar with. What can you do with it? You can regularize inverse problems and this is work that we did and I did not discuss here. You could generate images. This is what we have seen from Eros paper, Song and Airborne and others. In fact, a paper in 2015 already suggested it by Stoll Dickstein, but <laughs> nobody understood. <laughs> Try to read this paper to now, it's readable, but at the time it was not so readable. We can denoise images while targeting hyperceptual quality. We can actually do the same for inverse problems. And there is a lovely bridge between what we do here and what we do here. It's amazing bridge because you look at the equations in this paper here, you look at the equations here, it's almost the same, almost the same. Annoying me, annoying uh, how, how some they are, how similar they are. And all these algorithms, what are they doing? Iterating between simple operation and denoising, simple operation and denoising, so appealing. So this is it. So basically, denoising is not what you think, not anymore. It has a lot of potential and uh, it opens all sorts of opportunities. And we have to understand one big thing. Nothing in this lecture would have been possible without deep learning, because it's the deep learning based denoisers that are really creating the results that we have seen. Take the best of the denoisers from the classics. It doesn't provide those results. So we did, we did need this extra mile that deep learning brings us. And one last comment. I kept talking about images. It works for audio. It works for video. It works for molecules. It works for all sorts of data that can be represented and, and denoised. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miki, for a beautiful talk. Time for one question, a quick question. Ben? About the intuition, why the deep? Learning denoisers captures more of basically the feature of the images. What's your intuition about? So you're asking basically why denoisers, it doesn't have to be deep. Suppose that someone gave you a good performing denoiser and why is it capturing the essence, the prior of images? I think the same question came up yesterday. It's the most bizarre thing. Yes. 
God. You, you, you look at the proof by Mia, was that, Mia, yeah. Mia Sawa, and it's nearly a trivial proof. But as for intuition... Could it be maybe the energy functional of the Gibbs distribution? Is this an intuition? No, it's not. No, I would say the following. I would say the following. Uh, think geometrically. There is a manifold. Good-looking images are sitting there. If you threw me away from the manifold using uh, adding uh, white additive ga Gaussian noise, I'm basically vertical to the manifold. Uh, and so, if I'm denoising properly, I'm going along this vertical and I'm getting closer to the manifold. So it does know something. It knows the manifold. It knows where to go. This is my intuition. This is my two cents. Uh, for one last question from Christopher. Uh, I remember that uh, denoised images were used as evidence for a trial. How confident are you now that uh, you <laughs> provide the new denoised images? It depends on the strength of the noise. If the noise is weak, you will see that the spread of solutions we have is not so big and you can trust whatever you see, even in the MMSC. But if, notice that I've exaggerated with the noise in order to make a point. If the noise is really, really strong, then uh, you have a spread of possible solutions. This strengthens if you are looking at heavily, highly ill posed problems. In highly ill posed problems, say, for example, super resolution, you reduce factor four in each axis, you lose so much that even without noise, you, are, you, you, you have a spread of possible solutions and you have to be aware of it. It works for doctors? People, uh, Song and Ermon already implemented it for uh, CT and MRI. Uh, people are playing with it in all sorts of contexts uh, for medical imaging. Definitely, it needs to be done. And it, the doctors can use it because it's a matter of... Here is what we did in the last work that we had, that did not publish. This is part of uh, the work in Verily. We take an inverse problem in medical imaging and the doctors point to a point where he is going to make a decision whether there is a tumor or not. And then we give him bars to navigate between all possible solutions so that he can see whatever could happen there. And if then he is convinced that there is no tumor or there is a tumor, he make a more educated decision.